I'm the moderator of choice. Okay. You're on with us? Yeah, I am supposed to speak with you, gentlemen. Absolutely. I'm a, I am live here in the state of North Carolina. And and so, yourself. Uh, my name is Michael Brooks. I'm a health coach here in North Carolina. I also understand that we live in a state run by dinosaurs. Oh, <laughs> um, So I, the, the, the reason I'm here on this panel is because I'm passionate about this, but really is if you live in this state and you want to work together on making sure we sort of have a voice, yeah. I'm all for it and I want to get your info and I want us to just at least organize in some way yep. that we can at least make sure we have a seat at the table for whenever this moves forward legally, right? Because it's coming. And I want to make sure it comes in a way that benefits the people who need it and not just people who need to make money or want to make money, I guess. We're going to stay on that for a little bit because I think we've got enough North Carolina people in here. How many from North Carolina? Shit. Yeah. Oh, shit. So it's a whole group. Yeah. And so we're coming back to this because that's critically important. I'm not going to talk about decrim in some, you know, Washington state. Who cares about Washington state? <laughs> I mean, I do, but uh, yeah, you don't. So I don't need to recap every damn decrim bill that's not passing everywhere. Um, so we'll focus on stuff we can do. Yeah, well, let's, let's talk about decrim. Yeah, let's go. At some point, because uh, there's some important developments in some yes. uh, Things we can clarify about what decrim is, what legal is, and how it affects us going forward with the statute of limitations on felony prosecution. It is one of the smartest people I've met here at this conference. And, As there's uh, a big difference. Yeah, it's a, a, a fact. He knows some really smart people, and, and he's connected at a different level than I am. Which I got to tell you, going and moving in different verticals is astonishing. Okay. I just met a woman from Detroit who has no idea of a major psychedelic uh, 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 dick dynasty, the Kalindi thing in Detroit. Had no knowledge of it. And I'm thinking, how could you not? You're like in Detroit. But it doesn't work that way. Everybody builds these verticals and yeah, you have no idea. And uh, Amir, let us know what's up. Hello y'all, my name is Amir Zen. I am the founder, CEO, and product formulator of a cryptocurrency friendly health optimization company called Specker. My goal is to create a free, happy, and healthy world in our lifetimes for us to all benefit from it. And hopefully events like this can help us. And I've been um, heavily involved in decriminalization efforts, um, starting with cannabis. I'm originally from California and was working through those Prop 215 years during true decriminalization. Um, and that's why it's very important to uh, distinct the, there's a massive distinction between legal and decriminalized. And in North Carolina, I implore y'all to keep the decriminalization mindset alive because the governments and the corporations want to do everything to control and centralize these medicines as much as possible, and they've succeeded in California. When they remove Prop 215 by Prop 64, California's cannabis legalization bill, now the state has total control. They've ruined cannabis as a medicine. Now it's just a recreational drug, which is exactly what they want to do because now you can't outcompete the pharmaceuticals. And now the next step that they've done, they've even brought CBD into the fold yes. of their control. So actually now with psilocybin and ketamine and these things, ketamine, we already lost the battle. It's with the doctors. You have to go to their office and that's how you get treated. They're trying to do the same thing with psilocybin and I'm really hoping that that doesn't happen because then the medical monopoly, essentially the healthcare monopoly, gets to corner that as well. So we really have to fight right now as activists to continue decriminalization and educate the politicians so that they understand that they can still make their money even if it's decriminalized, because the state of California was making plenty of money during Prop 215, but they just wanted more of that direct control. So talk to the politicians out here because they just need to be educated and they literally know nothing. It's, it's a lot of just reefer madness type mindset. And then when you go deeper into psychedelics, it gets even worse. 
So if those people, and look, politicians, they, they're, they're not dumb people. I mean, uh, so, what, sorry, a lot of politicians are dumb. Uh, but they're open to learning, and they understand that if they don't go with the times, they're not going to get elected. So from an incentive model, they will listen if you just go there with the education. And I would say as a Californian, that was the problem with the state is that they didn't really understand that education factor. And I mean, it's California, they want to centralize and control everything. So hopefully North Carolina, not as bad. It's not I'd like to, I want you to uh, pontificate about the differences, the subtleties, because it, it's a real sure. interesting arena. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh, in terms of- Sit down. Yeah, right. <laughs> so in terms of the difference between decriminalization and legalization, it's best to just kind of put it in very simple terms, differentiate those two. Decriminalization, the prosecution of that crime has been deprioritized as a result of a voter initiative usually at the local level. Those are the ones that tend to be the most successful. Now granted, decriminalization movements have expanded into state territories as well, uh, state politics, uh, but they're starting to make some Errors politically that are going to tank, and I'll get into that later if you don't want to hear it. But legalization would be a fully legalized, open, regulated market that is taxed, that is uh, uh, falls within the jurisdiction of some sort of uh, regulatory body, ostensibly for safety. You know, uh, I am, uh, you know. I, I oftentimes will voice this opinion to, to some growers. I, I'm not a big fan of the FDA. Uh, I like the fact that there's not lead in uh, the food that I eat usually. Uh, just a little bit. Yes, just a little bit. I'm glad there's no lead in my own aggression. It's in my hot dogs. There actually is. If y'all didn't know that, the FDA actually has standards oh, yeah. for animal yeah. shit, animal bugs, yeah. parts. Yeah. Distinct standards for how much can be in your foods. Yeah, it's it's, it's gross. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So if you're vegan, you're never actually vegan. So. Yeah. Oh, that's a vegan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I will say about the decriminalization movement, decriminalized nature in particular, is that the
lives ruined as a result of something that is no fault uh, act. Um, now, you mentioned that uh, in terms of uh, centralization uh, being a key motivating factor, a lot of the uh, players in the California market, uh, you know, that same thing is happening with psychedelics in terms of the national psychedelic medicine market. Um, with cannabinoids, I may be wrong about this, I don't think I have. Um, I don't think there are any cannabinoids that are listed in the U.S. Uh, uh, inventory of uh, chemical weapons. Um, I know for sure. Yeah, I know for sure there are many psychedelic drugs that are listed in the inventory of chemical weapons. Uh, for the U.S. military. Um, there's a reason why one of the world's premier uh, psychedelic research institutions, that's in North Carolina, the Roth Lab at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, one of my colleagues is getting his MD, PhD there, doing fantastic work. Uh, however, it is a DARPA funded lab, it's a Defense Department uh, funded lab. Insert conspiracy theory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, it's so when we talk about making psychedelic medicine available for everyone, I think it's good to sort of just breathe and just think about what you mean by the words that you say. Okay? Do you mean that you want to have an unregulated market? where medical products and services are delivered by people who are most likely incompetent. Would you like that? I would, I would assume that, right? Uh, do we want to have an environment where nobody goes to jail for growing a plant or a fungus or sharing religious experience with someone? Does that sound okay? Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. So, so the words matter here, big time. Um, you know, now we're talking. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 a little bit longer. We'll move over to the mic. Okay, okay, sounds good. Um, you know, uh, in terms of centralization, you know, the federal government of the United States of America is pretty darn good at trying to centralize things. Okay, and to have control over uh, an industry through some sort of regulatory body. Again, like I said, FDA, I'm cool with it. Um, however, um, with the uh, increase in decriminalization and the reduction in powers of law enforcement to uh, use taxpayer money to put people in jail for drug offenses, the DEA is getting nervous. They are getting nervous and they are lashing out. And so they are trying to find ways to consolidate where they can. So they do these things called emergency scheduling. Uh, they've tried to do it with crop. They've tried to do it with uh, a number of different substances. Uh, currently, uh, there are two motions. Uh, one surrounds trypamine psychedelics, uh, five of them in particular, and then another one surrounds uh, Definitely psychedelics. Uh, talk to you later if you know what um, And uh, so I have decided to present testimony uh, against the DPA to prevent them from scheduling uh, first these five tryptamine substances, uh, among them DIPT, diisopropyl tryptamine. Uh, it's a unique psychedelic drug that is uh, uh, has effects that modulate auditory experience um, and uh, uh, brain imaging shows that it provides stimulation of certain pathways that other psychedelic drugs do not. So we're talking about a substance in medicine potentially that can teach us things about the brain that we never could have otherwise understood. All right. Um, if the DEA is successful and they schedule DIPT, simple science won't happen. Because now, all of a sudden, instead of having a lab uh, and a clinical trial, 
that it will cost somewhere in the neighborhood of $50,000 to perform phase one studies. Uh, it will now cost you, if it's a DEA schedule one substance, somewhere in the neighborhood of $5 million. Nothing leads to centralization faster than increasing the cost of research by order of magnitude. It taxes people out of the industry. Exactly. Exactly. It's what happened in uh, the 80s, they, they used, or 70s. You scheduled it, and everybody who was doing any research in the arena disappeared. Psychologists who knew it was a powerful tool, uh, they, they left and said, we, we're not gonna screw with this shit. And DEA was new, they made it in 73, so uh, they don't know what these people are up to, so they, they abandoned it. And leave, leave 40 years of zero research, or yeah. little. Yeah. And then psh, now we're trying to figure it out, and I waited all this time. The DEA needs to get out of the business of screwing with determining what is a religion, and whether that your religion classifies you with the ability to work with medicine, plant medicines that the earth gave us. Maybe we just get out of the business altogether. No, 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 we need to be each job is to control and uh, manage inventory of dangerous and not dangerous, but medical drugs. And they, that's their job. And you can tell how good of a job they did with our opioid crisis. Literally 10, I think it was 10, three times or 10 times the amount of needed material was manufactured because of diversion and loss in the system. The number was unbelievable. It's not like you'd have inventory loss at 20%. We gotta get the DEA out of our business. Reschedule the product, do not schedule shit that you do not need to be scheduling or schedule it appropriately at a reasonable level three or two or four and let it go through the program. And uh, that's the big one. We can all work on that. The Ames uh, uh, case in Washington is the Ames Institute is trying to give right to life use of psilocybin and uh, right to life is uh, granted in I think 13 states. And so we've got a case, Ames is fighting the DEA over a federal state's rights issue, which is good politics shit. Because the states say, we are in charge of health for our citizens, not you. not you. And so we allow the federal, you know, the FDA and the other agencies, but that one will be a strong one. We can get these product, these items to be scheduled or moved down. That's a huge thing. So I'm gonna let Michael speak about decrim in North Carolina and get your, uh, uh, actions. Yeah, like I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to pass around um, just my note, notepad here, and if you live in the state and you're interested, just write down your name, first name is fine, an email address, and in the, probably uh, after this NCGA session ends, and it'll end at the end of this month, I'm going to talk to some people, but I'll probably send out a Google form, right, and just get feedback, um, and, and, and we'll go from there, um, because, you know, we're in a, North Carolina's a unique state. Um, I won't diss Raleigh and, and the decisions they make um, too much because I, I do work with some of those individuals up there and I appreciate what they do, but we're ass backwards in a lot of ways, right? And, and, and I, 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 as someone who, who understands the cannabis industry and what, what's happened with it, um, we're, we're commercializing cannabis, right? We're not really legalizing it. It's just commercialization. I want to make sure that Right, that doesn't happen here. At, at least as long as we can put it off. And that's, you know, and then, you know, we, I just, I wanted to have access, right? Gift, right? Grow and grow. Yeah, uh, I think I want to know. know you said, so I'm going to pass it. I'm just going to hand this off. Yeah, let me see. Yeah, I'm sure about decriminalization, how we need to have standards for what that even means using proper language. I like to specify that we should be regulating these compounds like corn and tomatoes. They still have regulations, right. but they're generally, the government just keeps their hands off for the most part. They're not like, okay, we need to know how much of this is in your corn, and we need to measure this much corn, you can't grow this much. And so all of these regulations that are coming into the psychedelic world are just coming from viewing these plants or different synthesized compounds just as these kind of taboo things. And it, my goal is just to normalize, well, why don't you regulate corn and tomatoes like that? Then we shouldn't be regulating a mushroom like that. And if just 
one compound comes out of a mushroom that can do something else, well, you can go grab compounds out of those other products too. You can get high fructose corn syrup from corn, that'll kill you, but nobody's <laughs> regulating how much high fructose corn syrup you can pull out of the corn plant. So I think we should just generally be moving into a regulatory style that is already implemented all across the United States and it just works because when you go to farms, for example, and you talk to guys who are doing hemp here and then like corn and tomatoes, you ask them, what are the regulations for this? They say, pretty much nothing. And then you go there and they say, yeah, there's a list of regulations, it's really hard to yeah. move, you know? Yeah. So yeah. we could just yeah. move towards yeah. that. Yeah. Right? I mean, it was GPS tracking tomatoes. Exactly, yeah, like track and trace. Imagine if, like, imagine how weird that would sound if you said, we're gonna track and trace your corn growing, <laughs> your tomato growing, you know? It just sounds absurd. So to me, the absurdity is still the same with these plants and fungus and these other compounds, especially when they're not toxic, as many of them are. I'm gonna bring up, I'm gonna talk for a quick second about Ann Arbor. Yeah. The model of decriminalization in the country is in Washington County, Michigan. So Ann Arbor, always a free, early, they were they decrimed weed in 76. They decriminalized it, de-emphasized it, so cops have not been screwed with cannabis. That was for, before I was born, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember, I thought, wow, well, it won't be too long before the DEA realizes they scheduled cannabis wrongly, and probably too long ago. <laughs> And uh, that, that'll all change because we know how important these materials are. And uh, you know, who can tell us what to eat and grow? Um, and I, naive, a 20 year old. But anyway, in Ann Arbor, we've gotten the golden dome. Not only have we decrimped in the town of Ann Arbor, which you can't do here in North Carolina, the state supersedes yeah. all local ordinances. Is true. But in Ann Arbor, we were able to do that, and it's got a recognition for doing shit like that, so nobody paid too much attention. The county prosecutor right after that said, hey, guess what, I'm, I'm newly elected, and I'm gonna stop the war on drugs here. We're not gonna let people driving from Ann Arbor to Ypsilanti, about 20 miles away, and get arrested on the way, just outside of Detroit, on the way to Ypsilanti. So he decides to make a proclamation and he says we're not going to arrest anybody for plant work grow gather give share extract it manipulate it make it into chocolate i don't care as long as you're not killing somebody burning something beating something burning you know as long as you're not making trouble we're okay and the third leg are the cops the cops just for 50 years haven't given a shit about it they know how to deal with people on psychedelics University town, 100,000 people. They're not, they don't go bonkers to knock kids on the head. They, they tell them move along. And, and people are high on drugs like that, they don't do anything bad. They just stare at the lamp and move along. <laughs> and as long as you don't scare the shit out of them, they're, they're happy. They'll meander along. And the cops know how to do that. So we've got a, I've worked with you know, mushrooms, I've got material, we we'll share it. Uh, we, we grow it for ourselves, we, there's a little uh, donation or remuneration for energy and time spent, but we teach people how to responsibly consume psychedelics and how to deal with microdosing. It's, it's perfect. I don't have regulation. Now what we're going to add to the mix, testing. I have a, a testing kit that I'm able to measure the, the potency of a mushroom. We don't have to guess that it's strong or weak or some variant in the species allowed it. We know, I make a microdose capsule and I've measured the material that I've used and I weigh it accordingly to make a one milligram capsule or a two milligram capsule of psilocybin. I don't, you don't need to know how much weight of mushroom is in there. You're consuming psilocybin. And you only want to know that you're one or two or three or 10 or you're tripping your brains out at 25 or 30. <laughs> and uh, so that, 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 that's the point. So if we test our material and we know it's safe, our collective people grow the material and share it among themselves, um, and we educate people, it doesn't get better than that. And I don't worry about the cops. As you see, the, the, the decriminalization breeds excellence because it allows the small people to actually move because our hands are tied otherwise. And we can see with the California model during Prop 215, yeah. the cannabis industry was in a renaissance. 
and as the testing was on point, everything was just getting figured out outside of the state central organization who knows nothing about cannabis science, and then it just immediately changed. So if we can keep that decriminalization model, we can have regulation. So the industry regulations of the cannabis industry that we see today were because of the decriminalized market. That's what founded it, that's what built it so that when it was time to regulate, they're like, okay, yeah, we need to test for this, this, and this. Because yeah, we've been doing that during the Prop 215 days, we're in the black market. I remember black market guys would have lab tests in California. That was normal because you, as the consumer, expected that from them, and they were honest about it. And if we look at Prop 64 now with recreational, they have lab tests, but now they know how to manipulate the lab tests, and they're always changing. And yeah, lab shopping is a real thing. Right, lab shopping, exactly, exactly. It's a real thing in the cannabis industry. Yeah, I mean, so I would say in terms of uh, the decriminalized movement and what you're saying about the need to maintain the integrity of that movement, uh, particularly at the local level, um, that is something that in social theory is considered a temporary autonomous zone, okay? Uh, there's a, a, an author, Akin Bey, who has written some things about the ability for societies to change as a result of groups of people engaging in acts that are revolutionary or disruptive in some way, yeah? And the, uh, and so that, that's considered a temporary autonomous zone because the idea is that it will either go away because it doesn't work or it's destructive or they will network and they will then have strength mm -hmm. and they will then become uh, a group that works together autonomously without uh, being directed by one main centralized point of view, okay? Um, so, the decriminalized nature of it was an offshoot of something that I may or may not have been a part of in the early 2000s. <laughs> um, uh, I was part of the online uh, uh, psychedelic community, uh, Dark Web 1.0. Oh. Yeah. Before that? That was before Silver yeah. Nice, that's a real pioneer. <laughs> yeah, so, and those, we, we built them based upon this idea. Yeah. So you're essentially creating each individual as a node. Correct. It's like a computer program in that sense. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and then we were just overlaying, you know, the idea of us to whoever you know, showed up to you know, the funny thing that came to the funny and you know, uh, have a second. Um, we got our tracks. Yeah. Uh, but what happened? Okay. Um, <coughs> so this is a cannabis extract and cannabis uh, convention. Okay. Uh, there is something that's called EHO. Uh, uh, Butane patch oil. Butane patch oil. Right. It's right. gas. Yeah, you're using a gas station. <laughs> yes. Uh, the members of my uh, online forum came up with that technique uh, in order to reclaim the solvent so that it wasn't an environmental disaster. Yeah. Uh, these are people who are now helping to figure out the global aggregating supply chain. Mm. Right? Yeah. So, temporary autonomous so, set. That's, you know, not everyone can come up with a closed loop using honey oil trick. But people can uh, create these slow movements to tell the law enforcement officers and prosecutors so, please stop using my tax money to oppress my fellow humans who are doing nothing wrong and then to gather, build community. Uh, find other people in other locations who are doing the same thing, and then build strength and do it. That's and these people are all on LinkedIn. You can go meet your city councilors, talk to them, ask them, take them out to lunch, the district attorneys. You can become friends with people, and the more local your community is, the easier that is to do. And in our society, we think you know politicians are these high up people that are so different from us but they're exactly the same as us and it's just nobody wants to talk to them or reach out to say hey man let me take you out to lunch or something nobody does that but once you do that you have open access to educating these politicians about where they need to be moving
get in. So Mecklenburg County is a good example. So the city of Charlotte is in Mecklenburg County, for, for those of you who don't know. The, the, the DA, the district attorney of Mecklenburg County, Spencer Merriweather, has decided that his office is no longer going to spend taxpayer money to prosecute nonviolent drug offenders. Right? So you will still get arrested by CMPD. You'll still get arrested by Mecklenburg Sheriff. But the moment you're, you get brought to the prosecutor's office, they dismiss it. Um, and so, so that was something we were able to do on this county specific. Um, and that's really the approach you have to take. Um, we're, we're trying to get end enforcement, um, but unfortunately state law supersedes municipality law regarding law enforcement. So even though city council can tell the chief of police we not like to arrest people for cannabis or mushroom possession, um, it, the police can say, well, we're following state law. We're not going to listen to what city council has to say. So that, that becomes the kind of aggregate of the situation. But we can definitely get prosecutors not to prosecute us. And it's going to be real hard, right, for them to justify, especially if we're doing a health and wellness program, right? If we're saying it's for our spiritual needs. It really puts them in an awkward position. Um, but it is something you can do locally, and that's what I hope to organize us for, is to, is to go and attack some of these, attacks the wrong word, to, to, to kind of focus Core. energy, focus energy focus on, on, on some of these um, municipalities that, that are more, I guess, liberal leaning in their processes uh, to kind of allow us to sort of do what we do without the repercussion of, of us going to possibly change. It, it's local. It is local. Every collective I formed, Midwest Educational Energetic Educational Collective, it's local. I'm going to be sad to tell all the people here in business land, this is not national. Your product, you're going to make something in mushroom land and go national. I'll be an old man in debt when that happens. So good dream, but everything we do is local. We literally, our little co-op, we could form a cooperative here. You can grow mushrooms, or I'll grow the mushrooms. Maybe we'll both grow and trade off if you want to go on. You can't leave a mushroom grow for more than a day. Yeah. They're like cows, you have to leave them every day. So maybe I'll go on vacation and take a look, watch. And we could make enough mushrooms for everybody in the group. And we'll have some education and bring other people in to teach them. And uh, we'll test the material so we know what we've got and we can exchange. And um, gee, uh, how hard is that? Um, and we're gonna give them a few dollars. I'm gonna get a few dollars for growing the mushrooms because I get to spend some time and energy on it. And uh, we got a local community. So what I'm saying is the local prosecutor is under the pressure of you. They're elected. The sheriff is elected. They're assholes, but they're elected. And so if you work the politics of how that, because what does it come to? What did, how did this go in Mecklenburg? What did the police say? Uh, the you the know, prosecutor's not gonna prosecute. What did the police say? It's a, they don't get along. That happens in so many places. Oh, it does. These are just independent. Yeah, like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Our job is to think that's the problem, yeah. right? Is, is the cops are allowed to operate in this autonomy of guys in uniforms with guns can do things. Which is very un-American if you think yeah. about it, because this localized standard that we have is truly the American way, and if you're not following that, you're not following what the city is saying first, then you're not following the, the standards that built, that, that the system was built under, which is low, bottom up, yeah. not top down. And we built America from the bottom up, and now it's very top down, so we're just trying to switch it back. Yeah, I would just say, you know, when you don't have a police force and a district attorney that are on the same page, just remember that forfeit, uh, asset forfeiture laws will not work in your favor. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, so um, police departments, uh, they get a lot of revenue from seizing yeah. uh, assets, selling them, or... They seize more assets than burglars actually yep. take yep. in crimes. Who is the real thief? <laughs> Seriously, the law enforcement takes more in civil asset forfeiture than burglars actually yeah. steal. Right. And the burden of proof is gets bypassed because it doesn't even make it to the DA's. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. 
real sunny conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so we, there's a, there was something I discovered, you might be interested in this too, it's called Parallel Society, Par Parallel Society. It was, the, the book was written in 76 by the uh, president of Czechoslovakia at the time. And he's either passed, I think he's passed now. But this was written while they were under Soviet domination. And in Czechoslovakia, from what I understand, they were able to create a, essentially a parallel society that functioned without irritating the big overlords. And they created banking and lending and commerce and governance and judicial. Have you heard of Lieberland? No. Lieberland is around that area. That's it's in between be. Croatia and Serbia. They just started it um, a, a it years be. ago. It's still going. But around like 10 years they've been doing it, but they just it's essentially went going. into the middle of nowhere in these woods that Croatia and Serbia weren't really claiming. And then they just did exactly that. And now they have their own constitution. The place is run by cryptocurrency. They're, they're going to those national governments to talking to them. And they go around the world saying, we are our own free state. And we're the only real free state in the world. And they're proving, I mean, there aren't that many people there, but the model clearly works. And actually, I would love to add on to that because in America, we have the legal route to do that. Uh, one of the projects I'm currently working on right now is land development project that turns into government incorporation. Now, as Americans, we all have the right to create our own city, to legally incorporate, to go to an area, and legally incorporate, and you know who gets to write the laws and the constitution? The people who started there. So you can create these actual autonomous zones, but it's 100% legal. The county can't get you, the state can't get you, and the feds can't get you, because we have the 10th Amendment in the United States, which is essentially nullification all the way down to that local level, which is why the cities supersede the law from the feds, or they're supposed to. I didn't notice on North Carolina how they're it's a very, state. yeah, it's yeah. But, it's you know, in, in theory, the city should have autonomy. And you could do that through writing the proper bills with the right language. And cities do this all the time. Land, deve land developers go to an area, they build 500 houses, people move in, they incorporate a city, but these people are not doing this from a philosophical standpoint of let's free the world and heal the world. They're doing it to maximize profits. So of course the laws that are there look like every other place, but there are plenty of places like you're mentioning, the city just decriminalizes it. Now just imagine if from the very beginning of the constitution of that city, you're writing that constitution to do things like no victim, no crime from the very basis of your city constitution. And then as a result, those higher up governments have to follow it as long as you're within the bounds of the constitution, which what we're doing, these drug talks are, it's within the bounds of the constitution. We're not hurting anybody, no victim, no crime. So there's no problem really. Does anybody have any questions? We're, we're having fun and keep going and Louis is not, not showing up to stop us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll keep going, we'll keep yeah. going until he comes. <laughs> What you got? I mean, the uh, I have a Charlotte address, but my uh, county name is actually Cabarrus, not Mecklenburg. Okay. And so, yeah, how does that? I, how does that? I think work? it just works. <laughs> if, if you know, God forbid, if you were to get you know, um, detained, I think it would. It really just depends on your geographic location, right? It, 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 it's just because if they catch you in one county, but you live in another county, you're still gonna be prosecuted by the county that you were in, caught. you're physically in. Um, you, what we're hopeful though, is that this sort of catches on, right? That, that other counties, especially, especially as we're making it a budget issue, right? That, that, that we should be spending our taxpayer dollars on more pressing crimes, right? On, on, the homicides and the gun violence and these things did not utilize these funds uh, for nonviolent, you know, small time drug possession. And, and the reason, you know, and we, they get so much blowback from the police departments in particular is 
our police get so much national funding from DOD money and, and different federal agencies, right? And so those arrests that they make count in the tally, right? And that's all they care about is the tally of arrests that they've made. So they made 400 cannabis arrests this year. Well, that qualifies them for a tank in the federal program or whatever, whatever however it works out. And that's why they won't give it up because they want to keep getting those, that funding. And that's, that's really the trick. Um, it, 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 we have to figure out the budget and, and really go after budget is really, is really the, the mechanism that kind of makes this flow. You kind of show the governments that they can still make just as much money, if not more, by using this different incentive. Because as we know, in a decriminalized world, the governments can still make plenty of money. They just need to understand the shift in invest, uh, incentives. And obviously that's very hard when you have these types of monopolies with war machinery, yeah. Yeah. you know? <laughs> question, question, thoughts, opinions? It astonishes me how subservient we are to laws. My sister's insane about not breaking a law. I'm, you know, extrapolating out the, the potential for a legal action. And I, I think we're just frozen by this yeah, shit. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So. Well, per capita, the United States has more people incarcerated yeah. than even Russia. Or China. Yeah, it's a big business. So when you yeah. think about that, Huge it's business. mind blowing yeah. Yeah, yeah. to me. And, and when are you and so I think that, that paranoia, yeah. there's there's a reason for that paranoia. You know? <laughs> Good so point. Good there's, point. There's actually because <laughs> you are getting a fact based paranoia. Yeah. It, I mean, they're incented to do it. Like yeah. Michael was saying, honestly, the, to the, the industrial prison complex oh, is sure. really just a rebranding of. It's slavery. I was yeah, that's all. Yeah, just a freaking yeah, rebrand yeah. of what this country was founded on, okay. and that's, that's that's the reality. Of it. Drug war is just a new form of it slavery. Really is, essentially. It really is, um, and it's been you know it was written with ill intent to begin with, but it has been manipulated like nothing else since then, um, and it's really it's tragic. That yeah, if you see what Henry Astley was saying, it was super racist. Oh, yeah. And that's what formed all of these drug laws, the premise of, I don't like these people because they're that color. And that's how we built our policy for the last hundred years. Um, something needs to change fast. You know? yeah. 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 yeah, there you go. Louis must have shown up in the form of a bald-headed old guy in the back. <laughs> <It was. laughs> Yeah, we'll cut it. The audio guy's got to go anyway. So we'll oh, yeah, you got it. I'm staying there. Yeah. He's a 9 to 5. No, it's like, he's like, he's like, like, it's 5 o'clock. We're, we're Listen, just letting you go. You guys want to talk. You guys keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. Because we're all going to beat you up on the way out. Because we want to keep talking. <laughs> There's a long line for that. <laughs> Uh, thanks everybody for coming yeah. to this thing. Yeah. We'll be around for a while.